Welcome back, everyone. Um, terrific set of um, presentations in session three there, and delighted to um, welcome back um, our presenters. Um, so George and John and Monica and Martin here to take your questions, which were which were a little bit short on so far. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one we've got come in. A reminder that the way to get your questions is um, type them in on the Q and A um, tool on your screen. Um, and the first question that's come in is um, to George. If the future is in individual citizens accessing their health data and acting appropriately, how will population health levels, um, example, um, immunization and social environmental effects be managed and ameliorated? And isn't it unrealistic to expect individuals to obsess about their future health to this extent? That's a nice easy one to begin with, George. <laughs> Well, I mean, what we don't want to do is to create a nation or a, or a community of hypochondriacs who are thinking about their health on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute uh, -minute basis. Far from it. I mean, I think we just need to trust citizens to be responsible because you and I are generally responsible for most of our, our waking hours, we'd like to think. Um, and in our personal life, we use digital tools and services. We use technology um, to run uh, all aspects of our life. And it doesn't uh, dominate uh, every moment. It's ubiquitous in what we do. And it should be exactly the same for health and well-being. It should be no different to that. What we're basically saying um, is we need to just trust people. If we make your data available to you and we give you the tools uh, to allow you to use that data to make better informed health and well-being choices, to support you, to do the things that you want to do. Is that a bad thing? I don't think so. And with coronavirus, we're, we're living through one of the challenges at this very moment in time, but we're not recognizing it's a challenge. So what government are about to say, um, we're gonna relax the rules in the UK uh, and across Europe for the festive period to allow you to travel. And we'll make certain parameters. That doesn't mean you should do that what it basically means is you then make a risk assessment about whether it is okay to go and spend time with your family, et cetera, et cetera. But unless we give people access to the information to allow them to make informed choices, you give with one hand and you take away with the other. That's all we're saying. And it's all about how you use technology and the support network you put around about it. That's great, George. Um, okay, next up, um, this one to... John um, from NHS Wales Informatics Service. Um, John, what are the key challenges of um, getting Wales to adopt um, open air? And do you think um, that um, adopting open air is made harder or easier in a post-COVID world? Um, on the first part, I suppose there's a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I'm sure it's no surprise for anybody who works with uh, clinical colleagues that they've got this six week rule and, and, you know, getting people in a room to be able to start to discuss these concepts and things like that is, is, is sometimes quite, quite tricky. So engaging the clinical community is difficult, but we've got to engage the clinical community. So that's probably the first bit. And then the second, as I sort of alluded to in my presentation, it's about developing that exemplar project because, you know, it, it, in my experience, it, it takes a little bit of time for concepts uh, such as open air to, to actually almost percolate. Um, and I think really we need to present a project to uh, the clinicians and the stakeholders uh, across NHS Wales to describe what open air is and how it can benefit them. So they can literally, they can pod and poke it and, and destroy it and try and do whatever they like with it. But really, it's about getting hands on it. Um, in terms of post-COVID world, um, the, one, of the, one of the observations that we found from the work of it in, in looking at open air uh, was, was literally the, the, the benefit of being able to um, support a clinician who might be doing a ward round or something along those lines who, who hasn't got the time to, to get in the car and drive up the road uh, to, to look at whether or not they agree whether or not the blood pressure archetype is appropriate. So, so it was presented to me, and certainly this is the work we did with the Wales Cardiac Network, it was presented that can we use this tooling to adopt this almost remote, you know, uh, remote kind of, a, kind of approach. And of course, now we're in post-COVID world, um, you know, you don't have to worry about getting clinicians in a room or anybody because nobody's allowed in the room. Um, so so fund fundamentally, um, it, it's, it's 
it's weird so i think the paradigm has shifted so the things that and the concepts and processes that i was discussing with with colleagues you know a year and a half two years ago now are becoming the norm and it just means that we've got a shrink wrap process that's going to be able to support the you know the curation of clinical models um accordingly that's great super quick follow-up question for you john is have the other NWIS open EHR explorations found as much international archetype reuse as the 84% you had in your hepatitis example? Uh, we've got, it's clear, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot, you know, that, that's, the, that's the one that I documented uh, most of all, but we are finding, um, whether or not it was, it was related to me being on the more medical side of things, but, you know, that those archetypes have, have already been, been discovered. Um, I think I think specifically, you know, like what, what we found with the the cardiology work, for example, you know, a lot of the medical medical related specialties, you know, there's a commonality associated with, you know, the core, you know, fundamental foundational archetypes such as diagnoses problems. But then when you're into observations, virtually everyone wants to have eyesight, you know, sight onto blood pressures, for example, and things like that. So the the commonality is just there, um, and it was a it was a pleasing uh, aspect to the to the uh, to the work, I think. Great. I think a lot of people will be interested in learning more about that. Um, next question, um, this one to Monica. Um, Monica, um, what type of patient and public engagement activities have you undertaken as part of this work? Yeah, th th thanks, John. Um, yeah, no, it's it, it very important. And actually, it builds on what, what George just said, uh, really, about sort of making your having enough information to make your, your own decisions. So as part of the Yorkshire and Humber Care Record, we did two large public consultations, uh, one in 2018, when we set off on one earlier this year. So very much around sort of, you know, um, uh, checking with our citizens of of, of, of Yorkshire and Humber, uh, the 5.8 million sort of people. Obviously, we didn't go and speak to all of those, but about sort of two to three thousand of them, uh, as to what their feelings were, sort of post GDPR, post Cambridge Analytica, uh, about sort of uh, sharing data. And actually, we were very heartened by the response. Um, the uh, copies of the present of the actual reports are on our yhcr.org website. But you know they could absolutely see both for direct care and, and for secondary purposes, such as population health management, the importance of this. Um, and actually that gave us essentially the mandate to move forward with shared sort of care records um, and, and sort of reuse. A couple of, of you know, interesting comments was, but uh, please don't sell it to the Russians uh, and don't give it to those people down south. So we're sort of, you, we won't be doing the former, but we're working on the, on, on the latter. And at DataCan, we have patient uh, representation at all levels of governance. And I think it's so important to have that public trust in everything that we do. We might be doing everything absolutely legally, but unless actually you've got that sort of uh, patient and public sort of engagement and trust, then uh, we really shouldn't be doing it. Thanks, Monica. I like the fact that sort of um, Southerners and Russians are basically equated together there. Um, <laughs> the um, next question is to um, Mark. And um, Mark, based on the experience in Somerset, um, can you share any insight into coordinated approach approaches across um, trust boundaries? Um, clearly, projects like um, Monica's are, you know, much more kind of regional in their kind of um, footprint. Um, George is talking about kind of, you know, entire kind of um, national populations. Um, what, what's it like at the um, trust level trying to kind of get things to work across uh, multiple institutional boundaries? Hi, Hi Mark. Sorry, I'm mute button. Uh, yeah, um, it's, to be honest, I think it's, it's, it's not an easy task. Um, you know, both within a trust boundary and across trust boundaries, um, you could say that you know the, the Somerset approach is just to merge all the organizations so therefore it's you know by hostile takeover it might be a little bit easier in some respects but um, ultimately it, you need to form a system of technical and clinical colleagues together who can understand the problem that you are trying to solve and work towards that coming goal and that has to be improving patient care whether that's through the work that we've done within the trust or work that we're doing across the trust in Somerset, that's what it all comes down to is about improving that patient care and that patient experience. And everyone has to remind themselves of that. And, you know, Rick, when it comes to sharing data, you have to be unselfish. It's, it's not necessarily directly for your benefit. It's for the patient. 
Thanks, uh, Mark. Um, we got some specific questions here, which I'm going to put to individual folks. Um, so this one for Monica. Uh, Monica, is there a sweet spot for your use of SNOMED CT and open air in your experience? Oh, sweet spot. Goodness me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it's about actually looking at the, the practical sort of elements. So when uh, I was working at, at, at sort of trust level at, at, at Rotherham, we decided to implement sort of SNOMED across the board. Um, and, and actually, the benefits that we got from that, um, you know, sort of rippled through the whole system. It also meant that when sort of national uh, requirements for, say, the new emergency care data set, for example, uh, was concerned, we were sort of, um, you know, ready to go. Um, and, and actually, our emergency care clinicians said that, uh, the, you know, they were fully familiar with actually recording within the electronic patient record using SNOMED CT, and essentially it just cascaded through the other end. So I think it's actually doing that groundwork, doing that preparation, understanding the relationships between sort of open standards and, and actually sort of with, with, with open air, uh, recognizing that it is about the data and it's putting the, you know, the patient at the center um, and, and actually being able to, to, to do that. So I wouldn't say there's a particular sort of sweet spot. I think it's actually just the fundamentals um, and, and believing in it and not making it too difficult and, and, and looking to exemplars as to who's done it, who's done it well, what are the challenges, what are the lessons learned and actually then sort of, you know, building on that. Thanks, Monica. Um, keep good. Yes, of course, please. Yeah, because the, the example that, that I sort of cited with Hep C, you know, uh, but one of the things that, you know, I didn't go into the presentation, but we noticed that the, the level of granularity you have to go to in order to, you know, you know define uh, the, the, the clinical model is where you sometimes get those, the, those mismatches. So we found, for example, when we were trying to describe a you know, specific um, uh, type of uh, hepatitis C, you know, not all the SNOMED codes were, were there. But of course, Modeling to that level of granularity then exposes the need that you know the, the codes aren't as robust, and obviously there's a there's a well trodden feedback loop with regards to SNOMED CT to be able to improve that. So I think you know I think it is perfect example of you know open air reinforcing you know SNOMED CT, and and likewise you can say that from the fire perspective as well that these these tools actually are 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 all able to 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 support each other and build that better wide angle view. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, could I just bring G uh, George in here? We've got a crop more questions I want to get through. Um, George, um, can you say anything more about the Scottish national digital platform that is based upon open air? Well, we're, you know, we are moving forward slowly um, uh, into the new world. I mean, I guess from our point of view, what we recognise, I mean, it, it goes back to the, the presentation that happened first thing this morning when we, when, um, we were getting the US experience and how clinicians um, really rebelled against um, some of the, the global providers of, of electronic health record systems. Because effectively what they had to do is they had to change the clinical practice to fit in uh, with the technology solution, as opposed to the technology solution underpinning um, clinical practice. And what we're trying to do is not only to join up our back-end um, uh, siloed uh, databases, but we're trying to put a system in place that is actually going to support clinicians to manage patients in the way that they want to work. And at the same time, empower citizens to take more responsibility for their care. The mistake we made, though, is we called it the, the national digital platform, thinking that there was only ever going to be one of them. That's not the reality in this world. You know, if you've got a, a, a rural station, one one platform is absolutely fine because you've got trains going one way and a, one train going the other. You need a station with lots of platforms. And what we've got to learn is how you build an ICT plumbing system with multiple platforms facing both internally and externally that allows data to flow securely and safely and effectively where it needs to go to. And we're still on that journey. But this is the only ticket to get on that train, if you pardon the pun. I'm entirely pardoned. Thanks, um, George. Um, Mark, a um, couple I'm going to link together for you here. Um, first of all, do you feel truly in control of the CDR data and data models? And then um, fan mail from Jamaica. 
um, from help um, from an IT infrastructure perspective, does the way Somerset Trust lays out its uh, modules, etc., lead to, uh, itself to some infrastructure at the edge? Here in Jamaica, we have diverse geographical challenges and varying access to connectivity. Mark, a couple for you there. Yeah, so on, on the first point about truly being in control, uh, the answer is yes, we are in control. There are national data models that are available, which are really good, which are put together um, by people who are much cleverer than me. Um, probably an example of that is News UK. There is a data model. We are just taking our ops feed and putting it into the Open EHR platform. That said, on the flip side, we've got the likes of all of our core nursing assessments. And is anyone who's ever worked within an NHS trust, no two NHS organisations capture data in the same way on the coal front. Um, so we've built data models to suit our clinical nursing assessments. Now, what you have to do with that is actually look to what's happening internationally and try and bring that learning into your own work. But ultimately, sometimes you just have to do it yourself um, and push that back to the community and hope someone else can learn from it. So Cool. I'm um, clearly um, getting interest from Jamaica, perhaps some sort of study visit there when um, travel becomes possible again is in order, Mark. <laughs> So I would just add to that myself and, and, and Ian and colleagues are working with the Jamaicans and uh, uh, to, to to look at the sort of the open air uh, capacity sort of building um, and, you know, their, their enthusiasm and, and for, for for adopting this approach, you know, is is, is absolutely commendable. So I think it's a, uh, it, it's great that we can actually share this and, and, and learn um, with developing countries. Thanks, Monica. We're almost at time. But I'm going to ask you each for a very quick response on, on one question. How would you, as working in different parts of um, UK kind of um, healthcare, um, each characterize the zeitgeist on open air um, in the UK at the moment? Um, how does it feel? What's the mood music? Um, Monica, you first. Well, I think, you know, this this conference itself is is is, is there's very much a, a feeling of community and a very much uh, a sort of a, you know, a reality associated with it. Uh, I think there is very much that step change. And I think particularly with shared care records becoming absolutely the mandate uh, from, from the, the, the top down that frankly, we can only do it, you know, so through, through, through uh, open standards such as open air. So, yeah, I think it, it feels that there's a, there's a good buzz and people are believing in it. Um, that's great. Um, John, if you could go next. Yeah, um, the, you know, from sort of like the Welsh perspective, well, you know, generally, I, I feel I feel like there's this, you know, the open platform is, is kind of where, where, where it's at. Um, as we progress with the open air review, it was less about open air, it was all about, okay, there's that component, and then there's snowmed, and then there's fire, and, and all these things can kind of work together. Um, and, and generally, the, you know, the concept of, of, of openness and, and uh, you know, persistence of the data layer, I think, is, is a really powerful sort of like uh, concept. Um, I think j just generally, you know, the, the, the one size fits all approach for something like, you know, big, you know, big black box kind of uh, EHR vendors is, is there's a safety to that from a sort of like a, like a governance perspective for the decision makers. And, and I can understand why people make the decisions to buy those large EHR systems. But over the course of my career, I've, I've, I've always worked with clinicians and realized there's a lot around the edges. You, there's not one size fits all. So the platform has got to be able to be malleable enough to support those use cases as they come online. That's great. Thanks, John. Um, Mark, if I can turn to you next and then to George. Yeah, uh, it really, just to extend that, it, for us, it's always about being agile and being able to deliver agile solutions to a, a clinical need. Um, the clinical need Although wholly it stays the same, actually, you know, even though over the last six to eight months of COVID, we, there's been a rapid change in the clinical need in how we treat patients. And opening up our platforms and the infrastructure work that we've done has enabled quick, rapid solutions. And that's what we just want, really. We don't want a black box solution. Thanks, Mark and George. Yeah, if we are serious globally about patient-centered care, we have to have an architecture that actually is going to support and enable that in a world where technology transforms week on week. And this really is the only affordable solution for the medium and the long term. 
Thanks, George. And thanks to all our panel members for a really good, lively um, discussion. Um, that concludes session three, and it brings us to the lunch break. Um, before I kind of um, let you go for lunch, um, just a reminder, please do kind of um, go and mosey over to the activity um, page. Um, do post that, say hi to some of our other delegates, some of the speakers. I know we're going to be kind of um, going and um, taking part in that as well. Um, and then we are back um, at two o'clock um, for um, Aloha McBride um, as our opening speaker in the um, post lunchtime session. We've got some great international presentations from Germany, from um, Finland, um, and uh, many other places. We've got a packed afternoon for you. Hope you'll be joining us later on. Remember, keep posting, take part in the kind of um, chat and network um, on the platform, and um, do, do feel free to tweet and, and other social media as well. You can even TikTok if you want. It's down to you. Yeah? We'll see you later. Thanks, everyone.